Hey guys, so this story is a redo that Nick Beardy had done about two years ago, but it was in text to speech and it's a really good story and it's really worth doing it in voice acting. So I hope you enjoy and we'll see you at the end of the video. A year or two ago, we played a flat out amazing game, largely thanks to prep work by our GM. He set up this whole scenario where John is a TSA agent and looped us Groundhog Day style through this well mapped and MPC filled airport. We swapped objectives and skills several times and went a fair number of sh and strollers and burn them all games before we caught on to what I'll call the plot of the scenario and finally ended with what I describe as 4chan prevents 9-11 sort of deal. I love this story so much. It was quite fun though I admit it's far from the standard style of game. So there was four of us playing, voices plus the DM. We changed rules a lot, but after a while we settled into a few persistent voices. I'll get into those later. The first round was your usual game of everyone is John. John, the TSA agent, was a moderately overweight, balding white man who manned a scan and grope post at the St. Louis airport. He was diligently waving people through the scanner when a voice in his head commanded him to grab the crotch of an elderly woman he was currently frisking. This being a TSA checkpoint, no one even commented on John's behaviour, and he returned to his duties. This lasted for only a few minutes before he was seized by a sudden desire to shove the contents of a change and key dish up his nose. Why? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, it gets bad. Which caused considerably more commotion than the groping had. As three of John's fellow agents escorted him off to get the large key stuck in his nostril removed, John realised he was far too sober for this <gasps> and broke away. Within seconds he was in the duty free shop, chugging overpriced liquor like it was water. When the agents that had been escorting him caught up, they attempted to aid the store clerk in prying John away, which would not do. John cracked a bottle across one of the agents face and then in a fit of rage plunged the broken bottle into the ch- <laughs> I know, <laughs> plunged it into the clerk's chest. Things deteriorated quickly after that. But before the valiant agents of the TSA brought him down, John managed to stab and grope several more people, all while alternately taking pulls from his bottle and attempting to jam increasingly large objects <laughs> up his nose. I want to know how the putting stuff up his nose started. A short while later, John, the TSA agent, blinked as a horrible wave of deja vu swept over him, then waved the elderly woman in front of him through the security scanner. This time, as John looked around, feeling like everything was eerily familiar, he noticed that the checkpoint next to his had just confiscated a very nice lighter. He casually slid over, acquired the lighter, then applied it to a piece of luggage, awaiting detailed inspection. John hastily left the area before the flames were noticed, pausing only to scream, F***ing tile head! <laughs> at a turban wearing man going through the checkpoint. Several Middle Easterners in the crowd seemed to take offence at this for some reason, but were distracted by a panic yell of FIRE and the sprinkler system suddenly engaging. In the chaos that followed, John made his way over to where the mother was arguing with a flight attendant about getting onto the plane and away from the horrible rain of stagnant water, and relieved himself in the stroller sitting <sighs> unwatched behind her. <laughs> Even in the current panic this didn't go unnoticed. And once again, the chase was on. As John ran around the airport, shouting racial slurs, <laughs> lighting fires and pulling no less than three small yappy dogs from their carriers and putting them, oh my God, and punting them like <laughs> footballs. <laughs> but not finding any more unattended strollers. This TSA trained eye noticed a few things. Specifically, that some of the brownies he screamed at res Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought he actually meant like the the cake. Yeah. Um. That that some of that that he screamed at responded by gripping at pieces of their clothing or luggage, and that these people seemed to be concentrated around gate A ten near the end of his rampage, which was ended by a terrified firefighter's axe. John noticed that the undesirables near A ten had vanished, as had the staff at the gate. So after the first two rounds had established the basic setting, we joined around for a few more rounds. Some rounds were over quickly. These typically involved a voice that was particularly keen for John to draw his gun in the middle of the heavily watched checkpoints. 
Other rounds went a bit longer, and John accomplished an impressive mix of bizarre actions, sexual assaults, killing sprees and arson. Over time though, certain voices, usually the ones which drive John to the most impressive feats of insanity, began appearing more often and exhibiting greater control. These persistent voices were Billy Bob the racist redneck. <laughs> he was a master at shitting and drinking and his heart burned with a deep hatred for the government, liberals and non-whites. <laughs> he repeatedly drove John on selective killing rampages but would also mix it up with drinking binges and stealing the various vehicles on the tarmac. Wolf the ancient Norse berserker. Wolf was all about the <laughs> murder and arson and <laughs> under his guidance John beat far fitter men to death with his bare hands, battled the death against a SWAT team with nothing but a fire axe, and reenacted a proper Viking funeral using a jet and a fuel truck. <laughs> <laughs> Doug the paranoid survivalist. He was a master of jury rigging and booby trapping. Usually Doug's whims were little things, like finding hiding places or disabling surveillance devices. But he was the one who drove John to take over ATC Tower and fortify it against the police. They eventually had to resort to a National Guard tank to get him out. Professor von Schnift, Doctor of Paranormal Sciences. Blessed with an analytical mind and amazing observational skills, the Professor was the odd voice out. He wasn't interested in mindless gratification. He drove John to explore the nature of the time loop he was stuck in, sometimes by simply observing his environment. Other times, via more creative and violent means. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to talk to you about our new affiliate, Reroll. Reroll is a D&D 5th edition character builder app. Now, everyone needs a character sheet app for a tabletop game, but what makes Reroll stand out above all the rest is its character art. I personally find the character art really, really cool. It has this beautiful retro pixel art aesthetic and they are continually adding new races and items so you can customise it whatever way you want. They currently have 14 supported races, over 150 weapons and over 400 pieces of armour you can mix and match from to really make your character come to life. And the best part, you can have your own little cute companion like a little baby penguin, a flying kitty, a stupid looking pug or my personal favourite, a little corgi. And the best thing about Reroll, it has a free version with limited character art so you can try before you buy and see if you like it or not. We personally think it's an amazing app that will just improve your overall enjoyment of tabletop role playing games. Reroll is on Apple, Android, desktop and if you use our coupon code NECKBEARDIA at checkout you get 10% off. It's a great affiliate that we think you guys will love but enough of that, let's get back to the video. Over the course of John's various adventures, both he and the voices became aware of the underlying plot. The group of armed Arabs at Gate A10, which Billy Bob ran a file multiple times, was only the tip of the iceberg. John ran into four other similar groups, all equipped with weapons and cutting tools that never could have made it through security. Down in the baggage processing area and maintenance tunnels, where John was hunting for ill, <laughs> where John was hunting for leprechauns and delicious rats. <laughs> he found dead TSA agents and other agents who were more prone to violence than usual and did not like being licked by John. Uh -huh. While he was tearing around the tarmac in an airport fire truck while naked and trying to sing along to Britney Spears on the radio, John began to notice an odd uniformity to the luggage in some of the trains moving around. And when he attempted to run over one, he was terminally surprised by the sheer volume of explosions inside. Finally. During John's Doug-inspired takeover of the ATC tower, he discovered the armed infiltrators mixed in with the controllers, who Wolf happily dismembered, and the jamming devices hidden in a closet. While the other voices dragged John from depravity to depravity, stumbling over pieces of the terrorist plot as they went, the professor probed the nature of the situation. He discovered John's inability to leave the airport. The pale man in a suit who always seemed to be watching John from windows or the back of crowds and the time limit of four hours. Once, through an amazing effort of will, he even managed to force John to stay out of trouble and watch from the roof of the airport as the time limit ended. As five titanic explosions levelled the tallest building in St Louis and the peel man watched them from atop of the ATC, John, the professor and the three strongest voices came to an agreement. 
After a few direct attempts led by Billy Bob and Wolf, which ended in bloodbaths, it was decided that an actual plan was needed, and since we had all the time in the world to work out the kinks, we decided it might as well be a perfect plan. We would settle for nothing less than total victory. It took several cycles of information gathering, planning and testing. Admittedly, we time skipped and suicide a lot to speed things up, but eventually we pulled it off. From the perspective of everyone else at the TSA checkpoint, John called over a co-worker to cover for him while he took a short break and headed towards the luggage inspection station under the airport. On his way, he stopped by the confiscated materials storage area and picked out the biggest, sharpest knife available. Then, guided by the voice of an ancient Norse warrior and knowledge of his target's exact locations, he hunted down the half dozen TSA imposters and viciously murdered them all. At this point, Wolf relinquished control and Doug stepped in. John stashed his victims' bodies confiscated their radios and phones and headed off for where the five explosive filled luggage carts were awaiting delivery. On his way, he ducked into a few maintenance closets and picked up a collection of tools and parts which Doug said he needed. Once he was sure no one was watching, John opened a bag on each trolley and began wiring makeshift detonators to each one, using the phones of the dead imposters. After hooking up the final detonator, John paused and waited for the single phone he hadn't used to receive a text, then sent back the countersign he'd memorised. Doug, satisfied that the bomb had been planted, turned over control to Billy Bob, who commanded John to head back to the terminal and get a drink. After some hard drinking in one of the many bars which helped visitors cope with the horror of an impending stay in St. Louis, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, he makes it deserve it. I know. John staggered to his feet. He headed out onto the tarmac, then up onto one of the five planes via the exterior entrance. At Billy Bob's urging, he called the stewardess, oh god, a filthy... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he messily vomited all over the staff area and cockpit entrance. His work done, he scampered away, jumped into one of those airport golf carts and sped off towards the second plane. Behind him, the pilots and crew exited the befiled plane while a janitor was called. <laughs> Johnny's! At Billy Bob's behest, John repeated this performance four more times, which he managed easily thanks to a brief refueling stop at the third plane's unattended minibar. His work done, he turned control over to Wolf, who commanded John back into the just cleaned first plane, where he grabbed the janitor by the throat. John dragged the struggling man into the terminal past a crowd of confused vacationers and armed terrorists, then raised him into the air and threw him at a large rack of bottles at a duty-free store. While the crowd stood there stunned, Wolf ordered John to loot the janitor's lighter and toss the wounded man aside. A few seconds later, the rapidly spreading pull of alcohol went up in a whoosh <laughs> and John wheeled on the crowd. The brawl that followed was amazing. John, his pudgy face locked in a ruckus of berserker rage, beat seven kinds of shit out of everyone he could lay hands on. The police were called and airport security quickly came to check the disturbance. But the officers that reached John first hesitated at the sight of his uniform and didn't immediately open fire. Wolf, seeing that his distraction had succeeded, ordered John to break a nearby window and jump down onto a baggage cart. Back in the terminal, the terrorists decided that with all this fuss and their bombs already being loaded, it was now or never, and quietly boarded their planes. Wolf switched to Doug, who guided John into an unoccupied maintenance tunnel. Summoning every ounce of speed in his doughy body, John sprinted towards the basement security post, where he sucker punched the man currently on duty. Before the guard could get up, Doug ordered John to lift the room's gun case and put a bullet through the camera displays. As the guard staggered upright, John gathered up his weapons and scampered away down the tunnel which led to the ATC. At the final door to the control tower, Billy Bob took over, and John readied his assault rifle with a vicious grin. The controllers in the tower screamed in panic as John burst in, shouting about damn terrorists, <laughs> and immediately shot three of them. After the initial shock had died away, and two would-be heroes had been clubbed to the ground, John ordered the controllers to clear the runway and divert all flights. Mid-orders, John's voice shifted from Billy Bob's nearly incomprehensible southern drawl to the professor's crisp accent. 
confusing the hell out of the terrified controllers. The professor guided John through a carefully calm speech, which had taken us three tries to get right, and the controllers settled down and watched as he pulled the weapons off the dead men and the jamming devices from the closet, suddenly far more willing to believe that John might be something more than just an armed lunatic. The controllers redoubled their efforts to divert flights. Unfortunately, five planes ignored their orders and began heading towards the runways, which caused a great deal of panic in the controllers. John's assurances that said planes were filled with explosives and piloted by terrorists did not help. As the controllers made panic calls to the Air Force, John pulled his cell phone out of his pocket and dialed five numbers. All four voices in John's head watched smugly as out in the runway, five planes exploded into massive fireballs. The tower filled with cheers and John lowered his rifle with a weary sigh. Almost unnoticed by the controllers, John descended the stairs and exited out onto the tarmac. As the door closed behind him, the pale, suited man stepped out of the tower's shadow and offered John his hand. At the professor's command, John shook it and met the man's eyes, but did not speak. After a few seconds of eye contact, the pale man released his hand and smiled. He made a small gesture and stepped backwards, vanishing from sight, but leaving a faint shimmer in the air where he had been. John eyed the ripple of light dubiously, and then, at the urging of all four voices in his head, stepped into it. He was never seen again, at least not in this dimension. There are stories, and a few people still believe that if truth, justice, and reasonable amounts of freedom are ever threatened again, John will return and probably take a dump in the nearest stroller. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about you guys, but for me, this story, it's the concept of the game. Yeah. I just love... I've never read it before. No, and I, is, I really enjoy it. I, I, I would love to give this go. You know, this is a brilliant example of like team building exercises. Yeah. Because it's all the players, but they all have to be doing from one character perspective almost. Yeah, but I like uh, um, how each voice has a different skill point yeah, and stuff and it just works really well for you guys that don't know this is Shoggy the all three the, the old go- 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 sorry old guardsman party and um, he's got tons of other stories and um, many of you guys have more than likely listened to them he also has a YouTube channel so you go go check and, it out go check it out he mostly does like Total War videos and stuff but like I think like you know if you love his stories you'll probably enjoy his like videos this, yeah. you know what I mean so I would say definitely go ahead and check his stuff out you know um, let us know what you thought about this. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I hate whenever you guys do remakes and part of the story. I know and, you've already heard it, but I think it's it, worth saying it again. Yeah, I, and like it's been two years. So like, you know, try not to get too upset with us. And I, I, and I just really enjoy the story, so I don't even feel too bad. <laughs> but like, as always, hope you guys enjoyed. Remember, like, comment, subscribe, check the dad for, you know, all that usual stuff. Check Sean's channel out. Helps him out a lot. And uh, yeah, we'll see you later. Bye.